Um, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the um, the, the third um, session of the, of today international engagement. Um, we're very excited to have uh, a bunch, uh, a, a really um, representative group of international um, collaborators here today. But first, acknowledgement to country. Um, we do acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands in which we meet today. In my case, it's the Wurundjeri folk uh, from Melbourne. Um, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural, spiritual connections to country. Um, I've already said it's, uh, in my case, it's the Wurundjeri people and uh, we recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. So, um, Moving forward, you know, uh, the defining principle of the Australian Biocommons has been always to collaborate internationally wherever possible. And uh, I think almost all of our programs of work um, have at least one international partner, and in some cases, mostly international partners, uh, both in, from the scientific sense and from the infrastructure sense. And it's it's been such a powerful um, mechanism, I think, that uh, we've been able to collaborate internationally. Some highlights about international connections, uh, and, and Karim will talk a bit more about this. Uh, that in 20, 2020, we, we signed a, a formal collaboration with, uh, strategy with Lixa, which um, represents 23 member states in, in Europe, um, who, all of which probably look a bit like the Australian Biocommons, I would say, all of the nodes, you know, they'll have a fair bit in common. Um, and, and we've worked extensively with um, the National Institute of Health to establish US-based uh, human data commons technologies. Um, and we'll hear a bit, a bit more about that from, um, uh, from Jack in, in the fourth talk today. I thought I'll put this up because Australia is right between our major collaborating continents if you like. So uh, on the right here, we have the US. On the left, we have the EU. Each of these lines represents um, an hour. And it does make it challenging as to how we interact. And uh, I just wanted to thank again, you know, Corinne, uh, Jen, Frederick, uh, and Jack, who can't make it because, of course, it's 2 a.m. in Boston, um, for uh, being up at this hour. Um, one of the things I think we haven't done very well in Australia is to collaborate um, vertically, if that makes sense. We don't have many partners um, in uh, Euro-Asia and um, I, I'm not quite sure what we do about that. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave that as an open question. But um, at the moment, we're sort of in between the US and, and the EU um, and um, we get the best of both in some worlds. So the agenda for the, the next session is that, well, I've just spoken, and that's the overview. And um, we have um, Karin, who is the, um, the senior, senior impact officer at Elixir, uh, Frederick, who heads up the Elixir um, Belgium node, um, Jen, who is the um, coordinator of the Elixir tools platform, and, and Jack Giovanna, who is a, um, a, 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 a senior, Vice President in, in, in Seven Bridges, which is probably the biggest, probably the biggest um, commercial company in human uh, dynamics. So with that, I'll hand over to Corinne. Thank you. So I will try to share my screen without raising my hand accidentally. So I will, um, yeah, I've raised my hand. Somebody lowered it. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much. It's really an absolute ple pleasure to use the next eight minutes uh, to give you an international relation perspective on the short history of the Australian Biocommon and Elixir. So of course, this is viewed from Europe. This is where I'm based. I will put a link to the chat uh, to the to the slides in the chat, and you have some hyperlinks in the speaker's notes of each slide, so you can find out more information if you're interested. So for those of you who don't know what Elixir is, 
Well, the long definition is that it's an intergovernmental organization bringing together life sciences resources from across Europe. And the goal of Elixir is to coordinate these resources so that they form a single infrastructure, meaning that users of the resources, usually bioinformaticians, but also life scientists in general, can focus on doing their research instead of building the underlying infrastructure. And I lost, I, I stole that little bit, um, the, the last bit of the sentence to focus on doing their research rather than building the underlying infrastructure from Tiff Nelson of the Biocommon who said that one day and I thought that was just the best explanation. I'm sure she meant it for the Biocommon, but this is what we have in common between Elixir and the um, Australian Biocommon is that we want to make it easy for the users of the resources to use them instead of having to build them, connect them, etc. So Elixir and the Biocommon have the same ambition and they have many similarities. They uh, involved uh, several states or several countries, they are distributed, but it's true that Elixir has been around for a little longer. So I suppose this is where we were approached uh, for the collaboration strategy. So this is a, um, a timeline of this relationship we have developed with the Australian Biocommon. It started before I joined Elixir. In 2017, I wasn't there, but my director went to Australia and we did had a few in-person visits to each other's continent. And they were really instrumental in developing the, the collaboration strategy text, the drafting of that document and eventually signing it um, virtually in 2020, because suddenly something happened that um, threw a spanner in, a, in our plans. But nevertheless, um, somehow it, it has flourished, this uh, collaboration strategy. It has been implemented, I think, quite successfully. Obviously, you see more pictures, photos on the left than on the right, for obvious reasons. But still things have happened. In 2021, we had a, a historical joint session between a non-Elixir partner uh, and Elixir at the Elixir All Hands, which is normally a closed event only for Elixir, but the Biocommon came and, and held a joint session with us. More recently, we've had uh, Andrew and my director, Niklas Blomberg, give a joint presentation at a, an international symposium. And it was the only set of infrastructure that did a joint presentation, which is what you would expect when you do a symposium on collaborations, but we were together the only ones to do that. Uh, so we are today and the collaboration strategy is to be reviewed uh, in 2023. Maybe by then we can travel again, we will see. Uh, something I should say um, is that it didn't happen overnight, this collaboration strategy. Um, and actually, and this was discussed in the previous session, maybe the COVID story helped us a little bit here to be um, maybe to have more interactions because it's okay to send people to Europe, but you're not going to send 20. And when there is just a two hour workshop, you're not going to send someone. But we organized a lot of our events um, virtually because of the pandemic. And this allowed many of our uh, BioCommons collaborators to join when perhaps they would not have been able. And I've noticed a lot of the meetings now are organized at Australian compatible times. I know it's in your evening, it's still not in the working day, but it's better than the middle of the night. So thank you to the BioCommon. You have helped us to make us a little less European centric and a bit more international. So the collaboration strategy, in short, it's all written here, you know, the standard stuff, demonstrate mutually beneficial areas of activity, identify arrangement for long-term cooperation, of course, increase the impact of our respective funders. We are public funded. It's important to show that we are having impact, that we are useful. I've also listed the implementation tools that we have used, and we've used all of them, except the one we thought we would use for sure, the staff exchange and the travel grant. That one we haven't used, but we used all the others. So I'm very pleased about that. Um, something I would like to highlight here is that at least on the Elixir side, and it's the international relations point of, of, of my talk, uh, we had some administrative and governance constraints to deal with. Uh, you might know that Elixir is a membership-based organization, and we are accountable to our board of funders, the, the countries that are members of Elixir. And so we had to find a, you know, find the, uh, like a balance between opening too much or 
not uh, not opening enough to the uh, Australian bio government. And when I uh, not opening enough, I mean basically fail on collaborating, which I didn't want, but opening too much, meaning perhaps upsetting our board because they might raise the question, they are not a member, why do you open so much? But also this could lead to awkward situations with non-member countries uh, from Europe who do not have the benefit of a collaboration strategy. And instead they have to join Elixir and some of them have to do a treaty ratification, which is a really big process. So basically we don't wanna upset, upset them either. So international relation is about not upsetting anyone. And I think so far we have found this balance. <laughs> so let's hope that lasts. <laughs> so um, how does Elixir benefit? So I was asked to say, well, basically on this slide, you have the four objectives of our international strategy and all of them are really uh, benefiting from the collaboration strategy. Of course, some benefits are direct. We are clearly, you know, uh, improving bioinformatic resources by working together. We are clearly uh, strengthening our collaboration internationally, in this case, the BioCommon. But of course, through this uh, endeavor, um, users in Australia are made aware of Elixir's resources, so that's great for us. And also, uh, it's giving a, an increased perception that Elixir is international, whilst up to now, it was considered very European. So really, really happy about these effects. And this is the sort of things we report to, uh, to our board of funders and they are happy about that. So this is a, a mapping of where we are in terms of touch points of the Australian BioCommons with the various Elixir structures. And I say Elixir structures because yes, Elixir is building a, maybe a little complicated way for uh, external eyes. So we've got platforms, we've got communities, we've got focus groups. I can explain another day if you're really interested. And anyway, I can refer you to the other presentations um, showcase, but the little thumbs up show where there has been lots of interactions. And I should say some uh, successful interactions, we can't claim that this was due to the collaboration strategy. I'm thinking of Galaxy, this predates the collaboration strategy. Perhaps it has been strengthened, but you know, other things didn't exist. So the collaboration between the tools platform and the training platform, this didn't happen. Um, I think it was helped by the collaboration strategy. So it's in mapping. So feel free to let me know if I'm missing anything. Something that perhaps I could highlight here is that really the biggest benefit that people report from the collaboration strategy is the knowledge exchange. Um, people are amazed. They really don't like to reinvent the wheel. They love swapping ideas. They love, you know, bouncing ideas of each other, um, transmitting knowledge uh, in both directions. So this has been um, really, really good and it's been reported a lot. And for me as impact officer, this really shows that it's increasing research efficiency. And this is really what uh, Elixir is all about and the biogovernment also. So I'm almost done. You can't be joining it, but you don't know how. Uh, so I'm here to help you. I can do the swipe right and swipe left in the Tinder style. If you don't know what Tinder is, just look it up on the internet. Here is my uh, email address. And just to let you know, we are having an internal um, consultation in Elixir, and I will find out a little more what the Elixir people, the Elixirians, get out of the collaboration strategy. I'll make sure I ask questions about the biocommons. And I'm hoping to get even more insights into the benefits and perhaps how we could do things uh, better. So this is an internal, uh, an internal consultation. Uh, so it's really for Elixir members, but if you have something to say, please contact me because I, I would love to, to hear your views. Uh, anyway, I will be in touch with Andrew and his team to, to find out if, um, and I think I'm done. There we go. Thanks, Corinne, perfect timing. And um, a perfect segue, I think, to um, Galaxy, which is had six or maybe seven thumbs up. I'm not quite sure, but um, I'm gonna hand over to Frederick now. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'll talk today about the Galaxy ecosystem and how we're working together there uh, across the globe for um, making this a better and a global infrastructure. If you want to make a data analysis ecosystem for uh, life sciences or any um, 
science domain, then you need a lot of different components. I've put a number of those here. Uh, you need tools to run. You need data that you uh, plug in there. You need an infrastructure, computer, computational infrastructure um, to provide just the, the raw resources. And you need to be able to share this across registries. And how we see this workflows really tie this together and make this available towards end users. And if we fill this in um, with the kind of the, the galaxy way of looking at things, and we're doing this within the EOSC Live project in Europe, then there's a whole number of technologies that come up. And today I will focus on the middle part here on, on Galaxy as a workflow system. I'll talk briefly about Workflow Hub as a registry, and I'll mention how we use compute infrastructure across the globe to um, make this available for researchers. And um, in all of this, workflows are really important. And I think we share this uh, across Elixir and BioCommons um, that the workflows are the entry point for researchers to make things easy and to allow them to do their analysis. And that's where Galaxy comes in and uh, the global community that we're building. Um, Galaxy is an analysis platform, not going to go into detail. I assume most of you have uh, heard of this. Um, it's web-based and um, it allows you to abstract away all the technical details uh, from the um, users and um, allow them to run data intensive analysis on their research data. And in the last decade, uh, a lot of people have been using Galaxy and now we see that a lot of um, national uh, instances of Galaxy are being made available, and it's really um, a global effort to um, develop this further. And the three kind of main sites still that are there for already a long time uh, are in the US, Europe, and Australia. And we've been working together um, for over a decade on this. Um, but in the last couple of years, we started something that we call usegalaxy.star, um, where we want to align these instances uh, better. Um, because we really want to make uh, workflows and analysis reproducible, reusable across these different instances across the globe. And um, while Galaxy provides some features to make this easier, uh, you still need to make sure that all the tools are available in these dis different instances, all the right versions, the right data is available. And um, so that takes a bit of discussions. And we've been working on this uh, for a while and trying to organize this. And um, one thing that happened in the last, I think, year and a half is really making this a global community. We have some structures in place um, to bring, on the one hand, together the, the technical people, and on the other hand, also the more strategic oriented, and also there, Australia is well represented in all of this. And just to illustrate why do we need this in a global uh, sense, um, on the left, you can see a list of the subdomains we have in the European galaxy. And they rep represent the scientific domains where Galaxy is active. And you see it's, it's very broad. Um, and these map to these uh, communities that uh, Elixir is providing. So uh, we really need a lot of people across the globe to work on this because it's just too much um, to cover otherwise. And to kind of showcase that this works, I want to share a brief story about uh, how we came about making COVID-19 workflows available. So you can find on this website that's listed here, um, workflows and detailed information on all kinds of analysis for COVID and how we've done this and made this available across uh, five and probably more by now Galaxy servers across the world. And um, I want to share an anecdote here um, how we went about this. So you see here uh, two emails um, in February 2020, so uh, a year and a half ago, Anton Kotenko from Galaxy US um, contacted uh, me and also Andrew and Simon from Australia to notify us that there were a number of workflows available for uh, Galaxy in uh, COVID analysis and that they wanted to make these available globally. Uh, and if we could help out there. And um, about six hours later, um, Simon replied that um, he already got started installing these things. On our side, we were also working on this. 
and 40 out 48 hours later I, I got an email from uh, my technical person that the majority of things were uh, running there were a few uh, analysis still ongoing, but everything was in place to run these workflows and make them available. And actually the hardest part was getting the transfer of the data because there was an uh, issue with a transfer from data from NCBI, so we could have done it faster. And the only th reason why we could have done it that fast is because we had everything in place. We knew how to roll this out. It was just adding tools, adding the data, and uh, going through the motions and all the agreements we had with the usegalaxy.star. And this resulted in a nice, very international publication. Uh, but then we had these analysis workflows and we wanted to run all, all of this. And this is where Pulsar comes into play, where we build a network of shared computational resources. We also had a kind of a starting point in place, um, but we've extended this a lot during COVID. And uh, what this allows us to do is from, for example, you use Galaxy in Europe, uh, send jobs uh, to different servers across Europe and effectively across the globe, because also from Australia that we can run analysis. And um, this is really crucial to get access, for example, to specific resources. In the UK, we had GPUs, which were instrumental for structural analysis of COVID. And it's not just us in Europe using this, but this is also underlying how things are working in Australia. So we both have a vested interest in how this uh, can work. And um, the nice thing of this, this collaboration is that within Australia, there are different things that are playing. We always run across borders and there are some political issues that are more complicated. Here, it's within one organization consortium where this is uh, happening. So we can uh, also use this in some cases as a testing ground for new features more easily. And then to close, I want to shift gears slightly towards Workflow Hub, uh, which is a registry that we've been building for the last year and a half, more or less, to describe, share, and publish scientific computational workflows. Um, because if we have workflows as a central entry point for researchers, they also need to be able to find them and share them with their peers. And we've built this as a uh, system that can register any workflow. Um, we can refer to the native repository, for example, in Git, where that workflow lives. And uh, it's really focusing on finding the workflows and reusing them. And you will then get some uh, representation, as you see here on the right, of that workflow. And this one has been uh, contributed by the Australian community. And from the first day we were working on this, we've really treated this as an open community um, where we have bi-weekly meetings where also uh, people from Australia join. Um, and this has been very effective. And if you see here on the right, there's a lot of contributions from uh, the Australian community to um, make their workflows available. And one thing that I want to highlight here is that um, especially the community within Australia is very strong and has been very helpful to test uh, out Workflow Hub to give feedback and to make it uh, that way. Um, one technical feature I want to share here is this, this button that we have uh, in uh, Workflow Hub run on usegalaxy.eu, where we can submit a job or a workflow to the European Galaxy server. One feature that is requested also by uh, BioCommons and uh, that we are working on is to make this uh, more versatile and not just for the European server, but you can uh, then also run on the Australian one that's uh, in development. And then to close, um, I want to continue on this um, community aspect because for Galaxy, this is really important and people have been working a lot. And again, this is a global thing. We've been doing webinars. Uh, we have our annual conference. Uh, we have a lot of training uh, sessions where we all work together to bring this to researchers. And um, by doing this in a global way, we really can do Again. And then finally, uh, I've stolen a slide from uh, Karine, where I think that the points she made on the collaboration strategy, we really bring them in practice. And with that, I will uh, 
thank you and uh, leave the floor to Jen. Um, thanks very much for the invite to give a, a short overview of the Elixir Tools platform. Uh, it's, as Corinne highlighted, we've had great engagement with Australia Biocommons since the signing of the agreement. They really take part in our tools platform um, meetings monthly. And also before the pandemic, actually, we had uh, Australia Biocommons representative Brian came to our face to face as well. And I hope that continues in the future. Our mission for the tools platform is really to aim the improvement, discovery, interoperability of software resources and to really enable scientists to analyze life science data with this software. Of course, as Corinne highlighted, we don't want to reinvent the wheel with, with software. We want to really produce sustainable software that people can use in, in all areas of science. Um, we have the way the, the platform is set up. We have X course that lead it. Um, the three X course of the tools platform is Beyond Grooning, which people will know are also involved in the uh, Galaxy community. Hervé Menanger, based at the Pasteur Institute in France, and Salva Capella, which I'm sure some of you know as well from uh, Elixir Spain, based at BSC. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a, an overview of, of really the contents of the tools platform. What, what is our ecosystem development? So we have a biocontainers registry, which is uh, supporting software packaging with Bioconda. We have the Elixir Biotools, which, which probably is, is the most used as a registry to find software. We have Open eBench uh, run by Salva, actually, and this is a benchmark marking tool. Um, we engage with a lot of communities to present benchmarking data there. Of course, we have this, this collaboration with Galaxy. Galaxy is both a community within Elixir, but it's also engaged with the tools platform. And then finally, we have a, a software um, training activities, best practices as well, which is an important area. If you want sustainable software, you want to be, to be developed in the best way possible. And just highlight uh, the numbers, actually, uh, number of containers in biocontainers, we have 59,000. Uh, the Elixir BioTools, we have 21,000 tools and over 130,000 EDAM ontology entries as well. So it's, it's got a very rich metadata associated with it. Um, also, Open eBench has 35,000 tools instances and, and collaborates with 25 um, scientific communities for benchmarking. Of course, Galaxy has um, 2,600 tools and over 31,000 daily users. So that really is, uh, as Frederick highlighted, uh, used by a, a very large community. And, and just to highlight with developing of, of software best practices. We're, we've actually developed software management plan because a lot of people know about data management plan, but actually software management plan for sustainability of software is really important. And if you want to know more about that, there's a link to a biohacker archive uh, uh, deposit that we just made so it, you can find out more information. And at the bottom, just to highlight, as Frederick mentioned, Workflow Hub is really a, a new member to our uh, different tools. It was developed through a, a hackathon through COVID and now it, it, it's a major player within the tools platform. And of course we have the tools platform engagement with the communities with the nodes but also we engage um, with different communities as well. As I mentioned Galaxy but we also have a proteomics community. You will see this, this diagram on your right with the Tool, uh, tools and the platforms in the center, but we engage both with the different platforms within Elixir, but all the different communities. And I just want to highlight on the left, uh, as, as well as different work packages that we have within the platform, we also have what we call strategic implementation studies within Elixir. So if, if there's different areas that we want to engage uh, across multiple platforms, then we have these small funding uh, packages to allow this work to do. And one important work was actually around containers because of course we have the biocontainers registry, which has a lot of containers and is, is well used, but we've also uh, engaged with strategic implementation around um, deployment of that and engagement with the uh, 
compute platform. And as well as uh, community engagement, we have a, a wider engagement internationally. So we engage with Global Alliance, with also commercial AWS, RDA, of course, and uh, the new Research Software Alliance, which is led by Michelle Baker, based in Australia. We have uh, meetings in the evenings to really uh, engage with that, especially around fur for research software. And also Australia Biocommons is a really a major player in, in all these different uh, collaborations. And as I mentioned, we have the tools platform, but now we're developing as an infrastructure service tools ecosystem. And this is really enabling all, all the services that I've highlighted. So the benchmarking, Galaxy, uh, Workflow Hub, Biodoc tools and biocontainers within a, an ecosystem within GitHub that curators can uh, deposit their metadata within Biodoc tools, the developers can develop, uh, uh, deposit the uh, software within the different registries. And then uh, at the bottom you have your user perspective. So they can actually see these different registries and, and use them. So it's a whole um, ecosystem within itself that, that is meant to be sustainable. And of course, this aligns very well with the Australian ecosystem. And this is a, a slide I borrowed from Johan. And it really describes, you can see it perfectly aligns within the tools platform based at Elixir as well. You've got the workflows, the benchmarking, the fair interoperability within these tools. And there really is excellent um, uh, alignment with the Australian ecosystem here. And I wanted to give you uh, just a little highlights uh, going to the end of my talk about um, use cases, which are very important for the tools platform. You design these ecosystems, but uh, you encourage people to use them for different use cases. So one, of course, is a COVID-19 highlighted by Frederick around Galaxy. And this um, also used different parts of the tools ecosystem. So Biodoc tools have specific um, COVID-19 uh, tools registered within it by containers had the containers and of course with Galaxy it made different workflows to really produce and, and highlight with viral beacons there was a national dashboard created and it involved a lot of different um, uh, nodes within Elixir as well to produce this. Uh, another use case is really the tools ecosystem engaging with the communities. One example was for CNVs. There was a lot of benchmarking done at our previous biohackathon in 2020, which was a virtual biohackathon. Uh, we engaged with the Galaxy workflows around CNVs, um, also highlighted by containers, uh, CNV tools were engaged. Also best practices, we encourage people to register all the CNB tools within Biodot tools. And we're continuing this engagement within the communities, both single cell and the proteomics as well. And engaging as, as Frederick has highlighted around the ES Life uh, tools collaborative as well. So there is a kind of end-to-end -end engagement with all the, the uh, products that we're building within the tools ecosystem. And I just wanted to highlight in my, my last minute or so that um, we have the Biohackathon going ahead next week. Actually, this is a, going to be a hybrid uh, meeting. It's the biggest we've ever held, actually. There's 38 projects that are accepted. And we've got over 435 participants registered, both face-to-face -face and virtually. And we have a large Australian Biocommons team taking part as well. So we really hope that, that that will progress. And I just wanted to highlight as well, the tools platform roadmap is, if you want to know more about it, as I highlighted, Australia Biocommons is a, a major player within that. They are engaging uh, monthly with our meetings and will be engaging with uh, producing uh, both the outcomes for 2023 and um, input into what we will do in our next strategy for the, ne the next program. And so I'd just like to finally uh, acknowledge all the people that are taking part and I've highlighted here Brian, Johan and Steve that are regular members of our tools platform now and uh, happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. That's 
Fantastic. Our last presentation for the, um, the day is from Jack Di Giovanna. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, either rec I'm recording this and hopefully they're in person, but if my kids have woken me up, then maybe I'm sleeping and I'll answer emails and questions as quickly as possible. I first want to thank a number of people who've been involved in this journey, you know, really looking at the key question of how can we share and integrate brain cancer data internationally to discover new disease subtypes? Especially want to thank Allison, Mark, and Marie, whose slides I've used directly, pulling them from presentations that we've done together in the past. Since it hasn't been in the agenda yet, I first wanted to overview the Zero Childhood Cancer Initiative, which started in 2015, had a pilot study in 2016, and moved to clinical trial in 2017. It's a national pediatric cancer precision medicine program. It's, it's one of the strongest pediatric precision medicine cancer programs in the world. It spans multiple different omics, including whole genome and transcript omics, also patient-derived xenografts, methylation, clinical. And it uh, as last year got significant funding increase to be able to cover all children in Australia by 2023. So the key issue that we had in this collaboration was, despite the fact that it's, it's national, there's all these different hospitals that are participating, the number of high-risk pediatric cancer patients that come in each year is only about 200. Um, so in that case, you run into a statistical issue as you get a new patient in and you're trying to figure out where they fit within other similar cases with numbers that low, you, you might not have the statistical significance, but if you're able to bring together other data internationally, you would be able to create a larger resource and be more certain. So we partnered um, alongside with the Cavatica platform. So this was co-developed with the Center for Data Driven Discovery in Biomedicine from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia around 2016. Initially, it was also bringing together pediatric cancer data from the Children's Brain Tumor Network and the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium. In 2017, it became a key platform for Gabriella Miller Kids First. Um, since then, it has also become a core platform for the INCLUDE project for persons with Down syndrome and for the Common Fund Data e Ecosystem for NIH Common Fund Data. So within Kids First, both the CBTN and PNOC data sets are available within the Kids First Data Resource Center. Here's a, a nice overview from the portal showing the different data that's available in those studies. Um, this is separate from Cavatica. There's many aspects of Kids First. But one of the nice user flows here is you can go find this data on the portal and push it into Cavatica and then analyze it. So the challenge was how do we bring together all of this available data for authorized researchers, which is sitting in uh, AWS over here in US East One, and allow that to be co-analyzed with the zero data, which is in AWS Sydney or on local supercompute resources within NCI. And the problem that they have, or many people have had, is prior solutions, and this includes Seven Bridges prior to 2018, was they would always bring data to compute. So if you had data in Sydney, you could spin up your analysis there and bring the FASTQs in and get a result, get the gene expression. But as soon as you tried to bring over data, the CBTN data from the US, you would have this dashed red line, which was egress to bring that data from region to region. And then you would have the same problem with the results if you wanted to bring them back. So our goal was to combine these two data sets, but avoid that problem. So 900 samples, about 900 samples from CBTN of transcriptomics and 110 sample, 112 samples from zero. And we were going to do harmonized processing on those data. So the zero data will be processed with the kids first RNA seq workflow. And the CBTN data fortunately already had been processed with that workflow. So we have the expressions already available and then do clustering to identify distinct subtypes. Here's a visual description of that kids first DRC RNA seq workflow. The blue nodes are the individual tools. The gray nodes are the inputs or outputs and how it's wired together. Uh, if you can't make out the picture, that's okay. It, conceptually, it's bringing together STAR, RSEM, Callisto, Ariba, and Anofuse. It's available on Cavatica. It's also available on GitHub, and it's linked in the slides. You can check it out. At a high level, the Cavatica architecture that allows this to happen is the Seven Bridges core infrastructure, which is a collection of microservices here with interesting names that do interesting things. Um, conceptually, it's important that it brings together diverse user types that they're able to interact with this through a GUI, through an API, uh, through automations. 
But importantly, it links out to other data that is not within the infrastructure. So this could be um, data sets that are stored on AWS or GCP owned by Biocommons, owned by the NIH, owned by other entities. So the first thing that we did was to create a connection with the NCI resources such that data could be brought in or results could be brought back in the end. The second aspect is the projects here on the left. So here we're showing uh, compute and storage in AWS US East or in Google US West. So again, wherever the data, the source data is, we can send the compute to it with this model. The second thing we did in this partnership is to create an endpoint at AWS Sydney. So now the data that's over here or the data that's here in AWS Sydney could be combined with this analysis. Projects in the, so that left panel was all talking about projects. They are really the organizing block for research. So we have a project owner. She can add different members to the project, assign them role-based access control. And this is you know, a pointer to where the apps live, the files and the tasks. They're very important for collaboration and interoperability. They can be a security boundary if need be. And the owner can set a billing group also to distribute the cost of her research across the lab, across grad students, projects, et cetera. And to stand up these projects is really quite straightforward. So here's a, a video of me doing this to add one in Australia. Uh, it's as simple as this little drop down, and I can pick where it is. I turn on spot and memoization, and that quickly it's created in, in about nine seconds there. So because of that capability, now a priori we can design this to bring compute to the data, where we have a project in Sydney that's going to process the data in Sydney. For the data that's in US East 1, that's going to be processed in US East 1. So we have no egress, no red lines here. This may be the end of the story, depending on how the compute is. Uh, in this case, there's no free lunch. We do need to combine the results. So we have a little bit of egress to bring the gene expression results back to Sydney here, but we're able to do batch correction and unsupervised clustering in our studio, moving gene expression data, which is orders of magnitude smaller than the fast queues. So you remember the research question at the beginning, can we share and integrate this data? So the flow that we've gone through is to, to bring that zero data into Cavatica, bring a thousand samples from Kids First DRC and with the goal of harmonizing the diagnoses, ran the two pipelines. And then here we ran a, uh, Mark's team ran an interactive Jupyter notebook for a quality control and exploration. And then in our studio did clustering with the idea of identifying distinct subtypes. The preliminary results, and, and these are a little bit older now, so I'm sure there's even, even greater results that are available now, but I just want, these are already exciting for me. Um, bringing that data together, they were able to do a dimensionality reduction in clustering, showing here the zero data in red, uh, the two different CBTN data types in green or blue. And you can see that after batch correction, which still there's room to optimize, but after this zero data is really distributed throughout all of the child's brain tumor network data. And then when they do the clustering here, you can see some of the cancer types, for example, in light yellow green here are clustered pretty closely together. Also in light green, where other ones uh, in magenta, for example, are scattered throughout. But already able to see some clustering that's available by bringing that data together. We've been working through this for some time. Some things that I didn't report on that but are very important, and I want, I want to mention them here, is working through standards. So bringing in you know, Gen 3 that's coming online uh, across Australia, working with passports for authorization is very important, common workflow language for the reproducibility and, and additional things. The take home messages that I, I hope we conveyed here in this quick presentation, this partnership created immediate access to the largest pediatric cancer resource uh, ever generated in Australia, effectively 10xing the number of samples that are available to researchers. Um, linking back to the prior section, the platform is actually a, also a quite powerful tool for workforce development, being able to share tools, share data, and use it for training. Um, happy to talk about that another time. Um, Multi-cloud and connected cloud storage were key aspects for the interface to analyze data. And the pipelines that were developed are available, which is really great. Both the Kids First pipeline that we talked about and the Graphene pipeline that was developed uh, by uh, Mark's team. And finally, the optimization, which I won't get into this one, but the optimization and efficiency that happened in that development will allow more research to get done and bring researchers results fastly, more quickly, excuse me, um, ultimately benefiting patients and their families. 
So thank you so much for your time. Happy to take any questions. So that's the end of our presentation. I'm just going to switch across to my yeah, very poor joke, which is that Australia is not an island. I mean, we, we you know, we really need to be a part of what's happening globally. Um, and um, I think that we're working our way there. More importantly, I think that, you know, both digital infrastructure and data and data is global now. So we need to work out ways to find, to find out how we do that collectively. Um, and this last piece for me has been a really um, inspiring, I guess, um, uh, you know, directive, I guess, is, is that, you know, there are pieces, there, there are life, there are sciences that are not life sciences that have managed to do um, global research infrastructure really well and global science was research infrastructure well. And I, and I hope that we can sort of, you know, in, in some ways build towards that. Um, I think astronomy and particle physics have done it so very, very well. And um, I would really like it if we could sort of build towards that. That's our journey. So um, I'll finish on saying that Australia is right in between Europe and America. And, uh, that is where the, you know, the, 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 that is where our, our partnerships are, are, are most solid. Um, we have these, these challenges in, um, in, in time zones, and, but maybe we can make a benefit out of that because at the end of the day, this is going to be a global solution. There's time for a few questions, if anyone has some. Nice question, Andrew, actually. Yeah. It's Jack, <laughs> seeing his on. Um, I, I just wondered, you know, your workflows that you're using, um, can you actually deposit them in registries and share them? How, do you have any plans to do that? I know Seven Bridges is a commercial company, so I wondered, are, are these open workflows that, that everyone can use? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so the two workflows that I mentioned in the presentation, I, I believe are already on GitHub. Um, ah. Many of the workflows that we have are put into registries. We have an integration with um, DocStore, for example, where you can put the workflows there and potentially push them back. Um, I, I think there are some examples of protected workflows that are only available for commercial clients, but there generally would not be on Cavatica anyway. So the, mm -hmm. the 600 or so that are there are all, all can be used. Perfect, thanks. And I'll finish with that and say, thanks everyone so much for attending.